All right, Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. Here it is on a given Wednesday, and we have a special guest. Uh, thank you, Scott Foster, for connecting us with uh, Catherine uh, Blaunight. Blau Blaunight. Did I say that right, Catherine? It's Bachnight. Bachnight. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And and Catherine is a photographer par excellence. She's hanging in many museums and in many very prestigious places. She has made videos and she has made. Uh, she has made photography. She's a photojournalist, and uh, we have her on the show by remote from California. And guess what? We have a co-host who knows her personally, Marcia Joyner. Some say that Marcia knows everyone in the world. Of course. Why not? <laughs> I'm a Gemini. Person. You're supposed to know everybody. Yeah, well, welcome, <laughs> Gemini. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about you, uh, Catherine uh, Bautnai. I'm sorry I mispronounced that. Catherine, how, how did you get to be a photographer so dedicated and so, you know, widely ranged the way you are? Um, well, I, I started out as a, a painter in oils at um, Arizona State University, and then I was married uh, to my childhood sweetheart in, um, in the Air Force, and we went directly from my school to um, Germany and um, all of a sudden, well, a little bit of background is that my father-in-law, uh, Lavoie Bachnight, was a major photographer and had it in mind that I was going to be a photographer as well. Little did I know, he gave me a book when I got on the plane to move to Germany on photography and I wondered, why did he give me this book? I'm, I'm not a photographer. So, uh, as fate would have it, just about six weeks later, I was uh, in Rome and was on the, a bridge crossing the Seine River, and all of a sudden, I pulled out the camera that my father-in-law had given me, because the photograph was so, I mean, the, the image was so amazing. I just decided, you know, I'm going to try this camera, and then I fell in love at that very moment with photography and it's lasted forever oh how interesting one moment can change your life we don't have yeah. that we don't have that photograph here in our array that we're going to show people but i wonder where that is do you have that on your website no no i don't even talk about that very often at all but um i have it in my files but not anywhere that i can put my hands on this for sure okay well maybe we'll do another show we'll talk about what's in your files and hasn't been uh, you know released publicly so i'm just looking at some of the material i have on you uh you're at yale in the uh Beinecke library in the women's museum in washington dc in the smithsonian museum in the International Center of Photography, New York, um, the University of Arizona, the Center of Creative Photography, in the Getty Museum, that, that, a lot of photographs there, uh, and Harvard University, in the author and Elizabeth Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. You're all over the place, Catherine. You've taken a lot of photographs. Uh, you, you have been dedicated to the profession of a photo, photo, photographer and photojournalist. Uh, but I want to turn for a moment to your incredible experience uh, 30 years ago in uh, Tiananmen Square, because that's what we're, we're kind of looking back on this week. There's so much to, to remember and think about and analyze. Uh, and you were there. Can you tell us why you were there in Tiananmen Square? Um, well, the kind of extended story is uh, I felt that I needed to document communism uh, as soon as possible, because I believed that that communism was coming to an end, and I wanted to document what it was about, because that's what I do. I document cultures uh, for personal uh, reasons. I love that, and I, I believe that's the DNA of who we are and how we understand each other is through our culture. And uh, so I asked my uh, agency in New York City, SIPA Press. Um, Actually, the director, Jimmy Colton, who later became editor for Newsweek, um, if he would send me to China on June 3rd and of next year, of the following year. And so he put it off and put it off and put it off. And then all of a sudden, uh, it came back. And he said, um, Gorbachev was going to uh, Beijing. And he called me out of the blue and said, do you still want to go to China on June 3rd? 
And I said, yes, I do. And that was about 10 days before that. And um, so that's what happened. I got on a plane and, and I uh, arrived in Beijing on June 3rd in the evening. And uh, a little background information is that, of course, the Tiananmen Square uh, people were um, protesting there uh, about I think, seven weeks uh, before this. And you know, having a hunger strike and and um, peacefully um, celebrating the possibility for democracy. And when I left America, everything was just very peaceful, and um, I I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But I did have an inclination that it was going there was going to be a war type situation, but I had no proof of that. Uh, which is the way my my photography life has worked as a, a bit of um, visualization, uh, intuition, and education on what's going on in the world. And so by the time I got there, I went straight to the square. And 45 minutes later, they uh, started announcing on megaphones that they're going to shoot to kill, leave the square. So. That's the beginning of that night. What does it, how does it feel when you're standing there in Tiananmen Square in 1989 and you hear an announcement that they're going to shoot to kill? I mean, you're there. You're there in the crowd. There were hundreds of thousands of people, even millions in the crowd. And they say yeah, that. And how do you exactly, how do you avoid being killed exactly? Well, you know, it wasn't that I really thought I could avoid being killed. That wasn't what was going through my mind. What was going through my mind is how am I going to get these shots? And that's just the way, uh, you know, myself and most of my serious friends, that's the way it is. You just, it's, a, it's yourself, your body, and then there's the alternate self, which is the journalist, um, and especially photojournalists, because you have to be there. And uh, I've already trained my mind many times to to be in the moment, and and it's just a matter of you know checking into that that mindset, mm. and that's what happened. Yeah, you know, let me uh, offer a thought on that: is uh, is that you you feel as a journalist, especially a photojournalist, which is so tactile, you know, so connected, even more than words <laughs> in a funny way. Um, you feel that you're not there on your own account. You're on, you're, you're on the account of all the people who will ever watch your photograph. You are the agent of the, of the world to follow of all the people who will ever see what you've done. Uh, and I think that's uh, an incredible state of mind, and I can see the kind of commitment you'd have to stay around and not be afraid and run away. Yeah. Marcia, you had something? But as a photo, like... Now we get to see 30 years ago, no matter what, how many stories are written, it's that moment when you see it that it, it registers. Well, let's get in the mood on this and play a short video that you made with Danny Glover about what happened in Tiananmen Square. And some of your work is in this video, a couple of minutes long. Let's play that now. Everything was peaceful in Tiananmen Square when I arrived in 1989. And 45 minutes later, after I was in Tiananmen Square, suddenly we heard gunfire sporadically sounding in the background. And there was voices on a megaphone that were telling us to move out of the square. And as we would move to the east wing when they were in, when they were in the opposite wing, they would follow us. And finally, they started opening fire. In mainland China, the spring of 1989, hundreds of thousands of students occupied Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China. It was the largest pro-democracy demonstration in the country's history. <laughs> Catherine Bartnight was a photojournalist covering this story. They hoped for democracy and artistic freedom. Instead, they were wounded when the Chinese military opened fire. Instead of dialogue, the Chinese government responded with military force. 
we started hearing sirens coming and we knew something bad was happening. All of a sudden, we started hearing megaphones, the Chinese soldiers talking on megaphones saying, uh, we're going to shoot to kill, leave the square. All of a sudden, we just started hearing a popping sound. And people were saying, they're shooting. And nobody could believe it. And one of the residents of mine, there is, I think it's a girl, it's, she is a student, was shoot um, uh, here. She's followed down, very quiet. They started looking at me saying, for the free world, you know, motioning for me to take pictures. Catherine's pictures document the brutality, as well as the bravery of those in the square. If we really look into these people's eyes, we can see how important it is to them to be able to accomplish democracy. Well, wow. from that movie, you know, you can feel the, uh, the fear of it. You can, you can feel the, the threat of it. You can feel the historical moment of it, for sure. And uh, Catherine, you say this, this movie was, uh, includes you in many ways. You're there um, speaking and you're there uh, taking photographs. You had a real presence in the, the whole study by Danny Glover. And your photographs are there. Um, yes. And, and this was, uh, you, were, you were saying about this, is, this was, this riot, this, this protest and suppression was the day before the, the photograph with the, uh, the man stopping, the student stopping the tank, right? Can you describe, yes, can you describe as, what happened? Uh, well, I'm, as far as I know, it's the next day because when I got in the square on June 3rd, the, the, the massacre has not, had not started yet. It started 45 minutes after I got there. Mm -hmm. And so I was there during the unfolding of it. And then it became dark, uh, very dark. And, and so there, I don't believe there's any way that that uh, photo photograph could be taken on June 3rd. It, it was taken probably on June 4th. Yes. But June 3rd, the night of June 3rd, when it all started, uh, I can say from experience that that's when most of the uh, the gunshots were were shot at the people. People were were people died, and and then the next it went on on all through the night, and and then that includes the early morning of June third. I mean, I'm sorry, June fourth, and by June fourth, about seven o'clock in morning in the morning, uh, I came back to the square and. They were hosing down the square, and what I was told is that the, sol the soldiers, the government, whoever, uh, had burned the bodies and were hosing down the area where they had burned. This is serious, bodies. serious uh, oh. repression. Ooh. But but I I told you when we spoke earlier, Catherine. I, I heard a, a a cinephile, a cinephile expert. Talk about this yesterday on the news hour on PBS, and he was saying that this was a really tremendous threat uh, to the Chinese government, to stability in China. And uh, may, they may not have seen it at first, but they concluded after a while uh, that if they didn't suppress this crowd, uh, there would be a much wider, broader revolution. And that's why they decided to do this. But this was a serious suppression, and and it and it, and it shows you. That suppression is in the DNA, in the governmental DNA, if you will, mm -hmm. of China. Uh, they killed a lot of people that day, and then they destroyed the evidence. It's very interesting how that works. Do you know how many people were killed that day? Uh, this is what I do know, that the Chinese government first said that, I, I heard the number three people were shot while I was there in the, the next morning, and then, and then I heard, uh, I think it was, 300. It became 300 uh, after I got home uh, about a week later, and then it changed to the count changed to about uh, you know um, over 300. And now the BBC is coming out with proof that it was um, uh, 10,000 people, approximately 10,000 people. But 
before that happened also, when I was still in the square the next morning on June 4th, I was told that uh, the, um, in the hospital there uh, that they had counted 3,000 bodies. And then, and, so, then destroyed, and then destroyed the evidence. That's just perfect. I so, um, yeah, I want to, now, now we have some photographs that you did take that day. Yep. We have some photographs that you did take that, uh, that day of people who were wounded, and they are very disturbing photographs. Um, but we uh, elected on the side of showing them as uh, showing the reality, showing the history, and showing your photojournalism. And uh, we'll put them on the screen now, and you can talk about the kind of photographs you took. Here's one with a man on a table. He looks like he's in terrible shape. He's, uh, he's bloodied. Uh, he's a mess. And the people around him are obviously shocked. This looks yes. like it happened at night. Can you describe the circumstances? Yes, that was about uh, an hour and a half after I got there um, in the square. And that was on June 3rd. Um, that what had happened was I was in a different area at first and of the square. and. Uh, People saw I was, they saw that I was a journalist. I was carrying equipment. It, there was martial law. I wasn't supposed to be there. And, um, and so they would look at me and motion for me to take a picture uh, with their hands. And, and they would say, for the free world. And so that's when I really sobered up to the fact that this was, I, I was, I was the person that, had to do this right now. You were, and they were asking you to memorialize what happened, to report yeah. back. That's quite yes. an obligation. I can see how that would yes. affect you as a journalist. Yeah. I was concerned that they did not confiscate your camera. Yeah, how come yeah, you well, got that's away with that? Story. Uh, you know, if the, if, the, if the government knew, if the army knew that you were doing that and you intended to bring your photographs back, they certainly would have confiscated your camera and maybe you. Well, that's a whole other story, but uh, if you don't mind, I'll finish uh, telling you actually how I got that picture because it's pretty um, phenomenal, uh, if that's okay. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so in that area, when they were telling me that, they put their hands on my back and uh, you know, gently pressed down on my back for me to go through this tunnel of people. They made a tunnel for me with their hands and arms. And each person, as I went by, put their hands on my back to direct me which way to go. And I ended up right where that person was. Um, and, and the girl, that is also another shot that I've been wounded. Um, but they wanted me to be there, and it was right it was nearby Mouse Portrait, and it was it was just uh, an out of body experience to end up there at Mouse Portrait after I'd seen it on CNN, you know, 24 hours before. So I knew sort of where I was at that moment just because of being being connected with the news at that time, and and then it happened like. Why, right there, while I was there, it was a uh, projection of, of uh, a phenomenal experience. And, and so the people knew that it was getting ready to happen there, I'm assuming, to get me there seconds after it ha happened. And I believe that was the beginning of uh, what was going on in Chairman Square when, when they, the soldiers started actually shooting people. On purpose. Well, it's a statement of solidarity, isn't it? Those uh, students, those protesters were protecting you, but they were also exposing you to what they wanted the world to see. Uh, that must have been a, a tremendous experience for you as a photojournalist. And I also imagine we've seen two particularly gross photos uh, of people you know, wounded or dying um, in, in that day. But you must have taken a lot of others. We don't have them now with us, but can you tell us what kind of collection you have? Uh, well, the, most of the collection of the rest of them are uh, incidents that were going on with the people and uh, them uh, actually speaking out to, the, to me as the messenger 
and um, you know there were some some things that I don't even want to say actually, but um, mostly the the most of them uh, are the interaction of the students within the category of Tiananmen Square and how they were responding to it, um, helping each other. Uh, and the next morning, the depression and, and the solitude of the sadness of what had happened with smoke going up in the background with some of the trucks that were burned and just, um, just complete sadness. When, when it began, it was more like uh, a festival type uh, atmosphere, and when it ended, it was one of the most gruesome experiences known to modern history. Yes. Well, how did it begin? Why was it? Why were they there to begin with? What What caused the? F they were looking for democracy. That's been in the paper. This was a protest, a, a demonstration for democracy. But you said it was started out as a festive. Festive it, added. It, it often. I think these. The, and I was in uh, Turkey. Uh, with uh, the, the riots there a few years ago. And it started out as a picnic. It started out as a social experience. But then if the government comes in with, with smoke and, uh, and batons and, and the like and beat people up, then it turns ugly very quickly. And that's what ha uh, happened in Taksim Square in Istanbul. Anyway, um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you uh, is, you know, you, you, you took pictures. I mean, these pictures of the the bloodied people at, at night, um, you know, that's not, it's not ideal circumstances for taking uh, high quality photographs, but I'm sure you got high quality photographs, even close ups of the people who were speaking, the people who were protesting, the people who were articulating the message of the students and the protesters, and probably recognizable faces. Are you reluctant to show those pictures in public? Are you concerned that the Chinese government today would take steps? Well, I am concerned about that, and that's one of the reasons that I have not been vocal or visual, uh, with exceptions, very few exceptions, um, about what happened in Tiananmen Square until now. And the only reason I am now, and I feel free to, o to open up about it, is because so many other people are doing it on this 30th anniversary. And yes, I was, I was told uh, by one of the um, journalists that I was in the square with, uh, a writer from a news company in uh, Canada, that we, we were not, uh, if we had put the photos out of the people that we took pictures of, that they would be punished, the people, what? or their families would be punished. So, yeah, I, I was very... Um, concerned about that. Okay, well, I, I would be too, especially with the uh, Chinese uh, affinity for um, photo, uh, for facial recognition technology. Yes. Because they could recognize people off those photos, even though it's 30 years later. I'm sure they could. Well, let's, let's we, ha we have a few minutes left. Uh, before we close, I would like to go th through some of your other work, Catherine, uh, because okay. I, I think it, it, it sort of frames what you did in Tiananmen and and it explains uh, your life after Tiananmen. So let's go through some photos now. And I will describe them to you and give this the background. So we have a photo okay. of, a, of a man uh, a or woman. a woman uh, standing knee deep in water with a, a, with a pottery bowl. Um, and where's that from? What was that project? That is in Ethiopia. Um, the, the project uh, is called Bad Water and it was for World Vision. And um, we, we, I was the photographer for uh, Hired for World Vision to document these people who, who could only get water from one particular area um, in, in Ethiopia. I think it was three villages, and it was all, uh, you know, poison water. It was, it was bad water, and so they would, they would get diseases, and um, children were dying. And the reason I was there is to help bring that information out back with World Vision so that they could raise money uh, to help build wells for these people to get uh, clean water. We have and more pictures happens. in Ethiopia. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, here's some kids <laughs> playing in water in Aren't Ethiopia. 
I didn't talk. They were very cute, but you really wonder if there are antigens in that water that you know is going to make are. them sick. Uh, they're, Actually, they're yeah. drinking the water. Oh my so God. That's where their water comes from. They're drinking yeah. the water and it's contaminated. And, um, you know, the, it's, it's uh, I believe it's two girls. Um, and their hair, their heads shaved because they have epidemics of lice. And so it's hard to tell, you know, girls from boys. Uh, from a distance, but yeah, they're they're drinking the water because that's all they have. The cattle uh, also get in the water, and any other animals, and they also bathe in the same water. Now that's changed for that village because of this this particular project that helped build uh, wells and uh, purification uh, areas so that the people can have clean water. It's a thousand word. One picture is a thousand words, maybe more with megapixels. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Now here's an Ethiopian, what, uh, a, a mother? Yes. Is it? It looks uh, like a mother. And uh, a child. That is a, a portrait of the two, and that is a remarkable photograph. What are we saying there? Uh, um, there was this lady that had a hut uh, there, and this was outside in the, in the um, villages outside of uh, Addis Ababa. And uh, she had no money, of course. and she had a hole in her roof and she was asking me to uh, find out if she could get that hole in her roof fixed. And uh, I had just given her one of my a sandwich that we had for the, the crew that was working there. And she took the sandwich, which I thought, because they were starving, and I thought she would you know, eat the sandwich immediately and and fill her belly, you know, um, but she didn't do that. She put the sandwich like in her pocket and she had this child and I asked her, um, I asked her, uh, aren't you going to eat the sandwich? And she said, I mean, this is all broken languages. And she said, no, she was going to share it with all the other children in uh, the area of the village there and all of her children that she was connected with. Yeah. That one sandwich. And that, so, yeah. I, yeah. That photo I took that was, a, 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 that story is extraordinary. And it tells you so much, not only about this woman, but about so many people just like her, about the life and times in Africa and yeah, Ethiopia at the time. Heart. Yeah. It is a very yeah, powerful. And, yeah. And, and so I call her, I call that the Madonna. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. So now the picture we've been looking at during this show, it's you holding an award. Uh, what is that? What is that award? Uh, this award, an award for um, uh, winning, it's winning an award for Hawaii, A Voice for Sovereignty, a documentary, and it's given by the um, uh, Red Nation uh, Film Festival. and. Um, it's for uh, best environmental photograph, and it, it won eight awards. That that film was made in Hawaii over a period of five years, and to help raise awareness of uh, sustaining the culture of Hawaii through the voice of the people, and uh, helping to give the voiceless a voice on what has happened to their. Their, their culture. Well, let's uh, let's uh, spin through the last yeah. few of these photographs because we have to close. But uh, I but have a question for you, for Jay, okay. for you and Jay. Can we air this film? It's but, her yes, film. Of yeah, we sure we can, it? and we, we, we will. We will. Okay, but thank let you. Go, let me go through the rest of these because we, we don't have any time left. So this is what, uh, Hawaii? Yes. Uh, a, uh, a voice... Or sovereignty. or sovereignty. That was the name of the movie, and this is yeah. uh, some some of the materials about it. How long ago uh -huh. was this, Catherine? Uh, well, I it was released in 2012, and I started in 2005 and uh, shot for five years, and then spent the rest of the time promoting it throughout um, a lot of parts of the world: Italy and uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. And, and won awards in, in most of the places that we actually entered it in, in film festivals. And, uh, and then finally released it uh, 
in, in the theater in 2012. And it won some awards. Here's a, here's a, a shot of uh, the, you were winner of the best documentary film as a result of this in, in a variety of cities. Um, that's quite <laughs> impressive. Uh, now yeah. I want to go to the, some of the photographs that were involved with the film. Here's a woman, a young woman on the back of a truck. Uh, was that part uh -huh. of the film or was that just something, uh, you know, related to the film? Uh, it's part of the film, but it, I had a camera, a film camera on one shoulder and a, and a movie, a, you know, a, a video camera on the other shoulder. So that is actually a, a still of the moment where I came upon this young girl on the back of a truck on a Sunday afternoon uh, of Hawaiian uh, culture. And I talked to her father and he said they came there because that's it's really the only place they could go. And it was really a dirty area where some of the sewage was coming in and that the hotels, you know, had a, had some of the places that they used to go to blocked off. Mm. So they just went over there to this dirty area because that was in, oh, in their own uh, Hawaiian homelands. You know, I, I can't help but thinking that uh, your experience in Tinnaman uh, prepared you for this, or at least it it, uh, it it changed your way of looking at things, and uh, and yes. every every shot that you took after that is somehow somehow reflects your experience at Tinnaman. Let's go a couple more real quick. Uh, now here's a I guess it's a Native Hawaiian man with long hair uh, in the woods. Uh, that's a portrait oh. for sure, black and white. I guess. What's this about? Yeah. Yes. Um, this guy Aina, he is uh, a Hawaiian. Um, <laughs> person that that was helping me uh, understand what the culture was all about. He's really one of the first people that would talk to me on camera about the losses of the Hawaiian culture and the takeover uh, of, of, the, of Hawaii in 1893. And so he was in the woods, a wooded area. He was going to take me to a sacred area. And when we got there in that area, he was going to pick some uh, greens that he normally does to bring back to his family for, you know, all of his life. And when we got there, there were bulldozers right oh, no. in front of us. Did you get, the, did you were, get a shot of the bulldozers too? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> but but the, the very special thing about that is that you can see how the, the forest itself and, and the expression on his face is when he saw it. You can see he's actually got a plastic bag. You'll probably see a little bit of that. Yeah. And he was going to pick the greens and put it in the plastic bag. And so he, that was the moment that he realized that the bulldozers were coming to his sacred forest. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. That's a, more than a portrait. It's a story. And now I think this is the last one. Uh, and we'll, we'll close our discussion on the point with this. This is a Native Hawaiian man uh, holding the American flag with all 50 stars. Uh, what does this mean? Why did you take this? How does this relate to the film? Is that a hole in the flag? In yes. The uh, yeah. There's a hole in yeah. the flag. Very, very, yeah. a very, a, a very interesting, Marsha, that you point that See out. See where the stars, the, right at the bottom of the stars, right next to the stripe, the red stripe. Yeah. So what is this? Yes. Well, that's a kahu that... Uh, was very active and uh, in supporting the Hawaiian culture and and also what he's saying is it is not a Hawaii is not uh, it's not owned by the United States. Okay, I guess it makes the point. I, I really want to see that film, and I hope we can arrange to show mm -hmm. it on on Think Tech. Marsha, we're out of time. Catherine, we're out of time. Marcia, I want to offer you the opportunity of thanking Catherine. And, and closing our show. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you, even if it is this long distance. Perhaps you can Thank think, you, Marsha. Perhaps you I'm can think of coming back so we can show the film. How's that? Oh, that would yeah. be amazing. And it's glad, I'm so glad to know that you were on there. And thank you, Jay. Thank you, thank you Catherine. It's wonderful to have you here, and I, I would like to do more shows with you. Uh, either you know here in, in person or uh, by remote, one way or the other. And I would like to show okay. your sovereignty movie for sure. So we'll Thank talk you some so more. Much. Thank you. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. Bye.